I, I'm doing something not similar to this, but some friends of mine that are all podcasters, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of dying to see each other. So on Fridays, we're doing a similar kind of thing. Just, just rehashing old stories and calling each other a bunch of liars like most <laughs> old hunters do. But, um, yeah, I, I was just going through some stuff. I, I, I was going to do a little show and tell, but I don't think it's going to be handy to hold stuff up, up to the camera here. But sure. I was looking at an album behind me in this, this chest behind me, and uh, I've got a photo album. With my first hunting license was bought in 1972 in Illinois. So I am old enough to be your grand, at least your father, for sure. <laughs> Every man oh no maybe not jimmy bomb up there he looks he looks a little older i'm maybe not old enough to be his daddy but uh <laughs> i'm old enough to be most of your dad so i i was kind of lucky um j just in my early hunting experiences to, to be able to go more places and do more things without worrying with even even at, at a young age without parental uh i don't want to say supervision what, whatever we call parental supervision in the 70s was pretty much let us know when you're going to be home because there's no cell phones no beepers no you know we just said we'd be back sunday night you know it's kind of an odd thing and and there was more birds around there was better habitat there was dirtier farming and and that doesn't seem like you know i always think of that stuff in the 30s 40s and 50s but you know the 70s uh were some real heydays of bird bird hunting and uh and knocking on doors like my first trip to south dakota uh, I had one family name uh, once upon a time I went to church because we thought we'd make the kids go to church just because our parents made us go to church so we made them go to church you know until they were old enough to protest and I met one friend at church and he was from South Dakota he uh, his last name like all small towns out there anybody in that township would know that last name I mean they all had a half a dozen kids back in the you know, in the 50s and in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And that one name got us on to about five different farms. And, and we thought we went to heaven. You know, that was almost 25 years ago. And uh, I've just always been, uh, even though I was born and raised in Chicago, believe it or not, my first game bird came in number one long spring trap. It was a hen pheasant in the cemetery where we used to hang out. And if you can believe that or not, we had a three quarter, three square three quarter square mile cemetery into Chicago city limits that had everything in it except white tailed deer and there's a whole lot of undeveloped area and we used to try to trap these pheasants and yeah so my first bird came at the uh, at a number one long spring trap with some Elmer's glue and some corn so like I've been chasing birds as long as I can was trying to hit them out of trees with slingshots and wrist rockets and and uh, yeah, for some reason, I don't know, I don't know what, it, I'll, I'll never say that uh, hunting is genetic or it's in our genes, because you know, my family's a bunch of bakers and butchers and candlestick makers, you know, that I was just an anomaly, but I think just the fascination of, I love being outside. I'm sure everybody here was the same way. You just can't get enough of being outside as opposed to inside. And uh, so yeah, I started off doing that and uh, ended up moving to Michigan Oh, 30 years, but I actually bought a place up here after my first wife from my whirlwind 18 or 14 month marriage at age 21, the old age of 21. Um, when she divorced me, I came up to a friend's place in Michigan and, and put some money down on five acres of property. So I've actually, where I'm talking to you from, I've actually owned this place for shoot 40 years. And, uh, and even here it's, uh, you know, there, there used to be grouse, you know, slamming into the front window of the house we built here. And uh, I've just seen a lot of things change, but what I haven't seen change is the hunters themselves. I, and, and I'm not saying it's just bird hunters, but for some reason, it, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small tight knit group. Like if we all talk long enough, somebody's gonna know somebody that knows somebody. Um, it, it's, it's crazy small niche. And, and it's and it's kind of, to me, it's almost now, it's like, it could be gone. I, I think, I don't think it'll be gone in every state, you know, before I die, but it's gonna be, it's, it's already gone. Wild bird hunting's gone in some states, but the passion for it, I don't think will ever, ever pass away. The, the, the dog, the dog hunter relationship, it throws a bigger level to me into hunting than 
any other kind of hunting. And I, you know, I, I don't care if you're a sheep hunter who's got CrossFit strength and he can hike up a shale mountain and pack out a, a sheep on his back. I'm like, yeah, well, you take care of a dog for 365 days a year and go hunting and keep your wife hunt happy and get a second dog. So it's the hardest hunting there is. So that's just a little about me. I'm also um, a senior judge with a group called NAVDA. It's the North American Versal Hunting Dog Association. And we test, test and train all the pointing dog breeds that are here in America. Uh, and there's quite a few of them. There's 20 some of them or over 20 breeds that are, you know, fall in that same category as, uh, as uh, his, his short hair. And uh, it's, it's a pointing dog organization, but uh, it, uh, it's, and it's been around a long time. So I, I judge dogs for them. So I get to go and I say, I get the pleasure of, we don't get paid, but our travel expenses are paid to go all over the country, meet another group of people who have dogs. We set up a test and, and depending on what level of test it is, we, we shoot, retrieve and watch dogs do all their work that they're going to do come hunting season. And it just, it just, it makes its own gravy. You find more places to hunt, you find more friends, you know, it's, uh, it's been a, a game changer for me. And I got into that about, I don't know, I'm 62. I got that 27, 28 years ago, got into NAVDA and uh, it, it's a great group. So I can also say I've hunted, not well, but I've hunted in four provinces, uh, Alaska and 23 of the lower states of some form or another, you know, not always successful, not always bagging a bird, but traipsed around with a shotgun and uh, and my only my only uh, habit is uh, well, I recently quit smoking for the fourth time in my life. So my only real habit is beer, and that goes with bird hunting. So here's to you guys. Yeah. I got a black lab to do mostly waterfowl hunting. I haven't really done much upland hunting. He's six years old. At what age do you think it's right to bring in another pup? Well, I I don't. I don't have any rules on that. Really, it depends on your dog's temperament. Um, I've had dogs that will always accept, and you can believe this or not, will always accept a puppy, you know, a little annoyed by him or they might growl at him. But um, it's when that puppy becomes, you know, a dog grows up, by the time he's 16 months old, he's like a 18 year old boy or girl, right? He's basically mature enough to breed. He's mature enough to have a litter if it's a girl. And sometimes them older dogs don't like that dog when they get to that age. I've had that problem. I, I, I know a lot of people at labs. Labs are usually a real good disposition dog. So unless you saw him like mix it up with other dogs, does he, does he get owly or growly with other dogs? Nah, he's super friendly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't ever have less than three years between dogs. So I think you're behind the eight ball, <laughs> you know? Get, get that next dog as soon as you can. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. You bet. I run, uh, I'm out, out of Phoenix, Arizona, and I do a lot of quail hunting. And about once a year, we try to go up to like Nebraska mm -hmm. and do a, one pheasant hunt a year. But I, I just brought a new pup in. I run Britneys. I run, uh, I got two Britneys, an eight year old Brit and an, uh, a five year old lab. And I run them together. Mm -hmm. And I just brought an, uh, I got a, Christmas baby Brit that I just brought in so she's 12 or 16 weeks I don't know she's not very old right my question is is snake training uh, out here in Arizona we got a lot of snakes right so I, I want to get her out and get her in the desert and I do all my own training uh, but when's it too too young or do you think I can snake train her at this point you know she was born um, end of December so you're she's four months old and she's not been conditioned to e-collar. You know, we're doing all of our other stuff, but yeah. what do you think about snake training at what age? Well, I, I've never had a snake train a dog, but I know it needs to involve the e-collar for sure. I, at least that's what I understand. And I, I would imagine, is that correct? Where you've seen snake training? Yeah, like all my other dogs, they were a little bit, they were older when I got them right. done. Yeah, right. they put an e-collar on and they put a live snake there. They break the fangs off the snake and then they get yeah. the dog to walk towards it and give it and the juice. Up. But I don't want her to be, I mean, she's, She's still a pup, pup, you know. She, yeah. Old. Yeah, I, I would just always err on the side of age. Always, I would wait as long as you can. You know, there's so many things that dog has to encounter and learn. Um, 
and it, you've had dogs before and you've used e-collars, so I, you know, I don't know if you've screwed them up or not, but it doesn't seem like, you know, you haven't said that you have. So you, you know how to use a collar. So go on the side of like, let's just pretend this dog can't be around snakes for a while and get some, get some other e-collar training in. Like uh, just even the, the simple, I, I don't know if you, st I, I am not, I shouldn't say, I should say this preface it. I think e-collars are a, a miracle, but I've actually trained dogs to high level of test. I'm not an e-collar user very much. You know, I, I know how to use it. I'm not anybody that could teach anybody. I know that it's a, it's kind of like a mat. It's kind of like a magic wand. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, wow, <laughs> I can talk to my dog and my dog is, you know, 40 feet away or 400 yards away. Um, but I've always, you just got to read your dog. If, if that little Brit is rambunctious and you've already done some, maybe collar, some collar conditioning to go into the kennel, you know, that's a real easy one to start with where you just put some pressure on as you kennel, 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 and pressure comes off as they break the kennel way. If, the, if that dog can do that and do a few more, you know, in, in your collar condition, but if you're, if you're seeing anything in the timid side of things, anything hesitant, just back down and wait. Even if it means she doesn't get to go hunting this fall, you know, that's. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate it. I, I, uh, just so we're clear, I was going to get it professionally done. Like they do mm -hmm. it for a hundred, 125, but I'm pretty sure those guys will do any dog, you know, and I just want to know, wanted to know your experience on, uh, yeah. you know, cause the other dogs, you grab the collars and they are uh, excited. They know that's time to go to work. I mean, there, there's no negative right. response. Uh, the collars at all on them, but I'll just right. give her some time and, and ask around. Uh, I, I just Always think she's too soft now. Yeah. You know, I think we all, we all get in that habit. You, you know, the first dog I've, I, well, I don't think my first dog was a piece of shit. So let's be honest there. <laughs> that dog, that dog was beyond help. But the first dog I actually spent some money on and it's like, I, I was almost like, I was almost like in shell shock. It's like, I, I was afraid to do it and then I tried and I just, I, I actually waited too long to do things. Then the next dog, I was like, oh no, bench, training, table, force fetch, boom, 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 you know? So what I've learned is you you almost can't go slow enough. If you've got the patience in any part of dog training, um, this is a, a top secret project that nobody knows about, but now you guys do. I'm working on a, um, a dog training series with somebody. I, I'll leave it at that. And uh, and one thing where he's always stressed is this is not a race. Take your time. You could start, let's just say, the force fest process on a young dog, the hold and carry part, and you could come back a year later and pick it up. Now, the dog, it won't take him very long to remember everything you taught him when he was a puppy for hold and carry, if you want to do that. It just, you can, you can make this, you can make it stretch out to three years, or if you want to be aggressive and you got the right mentality dog with all the get up and go and, and almost a little, uh, there's a good friend of mine that used to say, if the dog doesn't have a little, a little F you in it, it ain't a very good dog. Well, he, I think he's kind of right. I like a little bit of that in a dog, but if you get a dog that's got a little of that and you can read the dog, you can start some training. I've seen dogs trained to a, a high level of testing at literally a year, like, you know, shockingly. And without, without the demeanor taken out of the dog, the dog is just, you know, tails, tails happy. The eyes are bright. You know, he doesn't look like this, but that's that. Always think of dogs and kids. There was always those kids. I remember going to school that were like athletes, you know, like, we used to have to do what was called the president's physical fit thing back in the sixties in grade school. And you had to do so many push-ups, chin-ups and run. And I was just like your average kid, you know, but there were some kids there that were just natural athletes. You know, they could pull chins right away, you know, and, and they could do more sit-ups than everybody. Or there's dogs are the same way. It's learning to read your dog and knowing what it can take in pressure. And, uh, and if you've had a couple dogs, just always let your dog kind of decide when it's ready. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have some lacy game dogs, so they're not bird dogs. 
but my male, he's about 16 months old, and I was wondering if you had any tips on dealing with a dog that seems just a little gun shy. He's definitely, he's not just flat scared of guns, but when a gun comes out, he seems to recognize that it's there, and it kind of changes his demeanor. He'll still work, he'll still track, but he's, he definitely recognizes that the gun's there, and it changes him a little, makes him a little timid. Yeah. yeah. What, what did you refer to these dogs as? Uh, what kind of so, game dogs? Lacey game dog or a blue lacy. Uh, it's a state dog of Texas here. Uh, okay, and what what are you using them on pigs or? Uh, tracking wounded deer, whitetail. Oh, tracking wounded deer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, gun gun shyness is something that a lot of bird dogs suffer from. I mean, you know, and that means from I mean from flushers to pointers, um, and and there's probably a lot of you know in the hound world. I I don't have that many hound friend friends. Um, but gun shyness, it's, it's, it's sometimes, say this, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. Um, sometimes it's the dog's temperament. It goes back to my analogy with kids. There was always that kid that was just, the, you know, he, he was just always a little shyer, a little bit more in the corner. You know, later on he got a job and he's fine. He raised the family. He's a good guy. But when he's a kid, and it just might have been maybe a little too much for that dog. He might have, where even his litter mates were ready to do it. So what do you see from him when a gunshot does? Because if you're tracking big game, you're not you're not shooting the game all the time. You're just tracking it. What? When? When did you see this gun sensitivity? Guy, uh, it was this year that uh, we were tracking a a white tail doe, and mm -hmm. I had my rifle in hand and he he just was acting real timid with it and then I noticed um, so when we came back to the house later that day I got out and walked in with it and everything and then I, I uh, fired off a blank it's a black powder rifle I just fired off yeah. a cap and he he flinched at it yeah and, yeah um, we did a lot of work early on I think Part of the problem was I, I kind of let it lax during deer season, where mm -hmm. I didn't really working him as much around the gun. I don't know if that's the case or not. Well, I, I can only relate it to uh, the, the dogs I've seen and, and the dogs I've personally screwed up, which are, there's a couple of them, you know. Um, and I don't say I screwed up. Their, their temperament was not such that I could do what I did with the other dog. Like, I was, I was always like, there, there's a real good way, if you've got a bird dog, it, most trainers will tell you, exposure to gun should only come when they are completely preoccupied with something they are focused on. So like for a bird dog, whether it's a flusher or a pointer, you get that dog around some game and the game is produced, whether it's by you or by a launcher or by your buddy or by the dog flushing it. And that in a dog is, you know, this is something you're doing early in a dog's life. So any dog, flusher or pointer, or, or a dog, you kicked up a pheasant somewhere, I bet your dog would chase it. You know, I mean, it'd be cool. It'd be like, wow, you know. So we introduce that noise to the dog when the dog is totally preoccupied with something he's crazy about. So in my in my 1960s analogy, where I, the world I live in, if 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 your buddy was showing you a Playboy magazine that we used to go in people's garbage cans in the alleys of Chicago, we'd find them because the old men would, you know, throw them in the garbage. You, a bomb could have went off when we were looking at that magazine. We wouldn't even have known that somebody was shooting or a, ba a, a truck backfired because we're looking at the centerfold. Dogs are the same way when they're when they're focused on on the game that they were intended to do that's when you introduce the gunfire. And at that, it's even way back in the distance. Like, uh, I, you'll have to correlate this to your own needs, but if I was getting a, my next puppy ready, I'm gonna know where there's a bird, I'm gonna let him get into the bird, he's gonna chase the bird, and as he's 50, 60, 70 yards, because these dogs are, you know, I love dogs, but they're, they're dumb. They actually think they can catch a wild bird. You know, they can't, but they try. and. Uh, 
when he's chasing that bird and he thinks he's going to catch it and he's 50, 60 yards away from me, that's when I make the noise of the gun back here behind me. And then later on, it's a little to the side of me. And the next, next time in the bird, the gunshot is kind of facing in the direction he's walking, but it's always at 50 yards. So if you take that, if you find something that your dog is just nuts about, whether it's jumping after a bumper in the water or dragging, um, when you guys practice uh, tracking, I, I'm not, I've done a little bit, but if there's something that like you could do a drag, you know, like when you, if you ever drag like a deer hoof or a deer pelt on the ground yeah. to get them here tracking. Yeah. If that you were doing that with one and he was super focused and off in the distance, and I mean distance, like to where your ears, dog's ears are way more sensitive. Make sure your ears would just hear a little pop, 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 pop. But if he was doing a chore that he was focused on, you could introduce gunfire and that also will help you, that'll help you, you let your friend do the shooting way back there and that'll let you read the dog. If he's, if he's working that track and you got him on a leash, you know, in this, I know, I think in Texas, you can let him go in some spots, but let, I would keep him on the lead so you could observe him. And let's say he's 10 feet ahead of you, you know, pulling like a sled dog going after something. And if somebody's shooting 50 yards away, you'll be able to watch his demeanor. And if his demeanor stays the same on the game, do it again the next time. Have that gun fired just a little bit. You're just gonna wean it in, you know, because there are some dogs that really bulletproof, you know. My, my first German short hair, I don't care what you did, that dog was not gonna be gun shy. It was, it, I, it was just a sight of ridiculously, you know, overexcited. It was, nothing bothered that dog. And then another one I had, you know, ran back to, that was born out of that female. First time it heard a gunshot, it ran back to the truck, you know. So you're just dealing with genetics there, but you can get around it as long as, as long as you keep the dog interested in what it likes the most. Yeah. Um, I said, yeah, I feel like super under equipped here as far as experience. You guys are clearly way, way further ahead of me, but uh, I'm looking to get a dog. We hunted me and my buddy uh, for the first time seriously last year. Uh, nice. Did okay on turkey, okay on deer. We tried going out for birds a couple times and watching the guys with the dogs versus us trying to kick our way up the sides of uh, the sides of the edging there. It's just, it's pointless. Uh, so I'm gonna pull the trigger, but I work a lot and uh, I live in the city, uh, Boston. Yeah. And I mean, I got outside space. I can get a dog walker, all that. I'm interested to know what kind of time do I need to be able to train this right? I don't wanna put the dog in a situation where, you know, didn't get the attention it needs and I got the expectations for it I can't meet well I would say do you have uh, do you have the ability to put up a, a, a small kennel run on this house or side of your garage okay. or is some, or is somebody home all day that could let the dog out a few times no I could put a cage out yeah if you you can put a run up I, I, I've had this happen a lot of times you can you can over crate a dog like you, you've heard a cur Crate train. I'm sure you've mm -hmm. done a little research. Oh so yeah, I've had dogs too. My whole life, just never a working right. dog. Right, never a working dog. So yeah, treat it just like your other dogs. And I always just recommend to people give them an outside run when you're at work. Let them have an inside, you know, a box that they can go into, and an outside run. So so they're not just bored to death, you know. And then when you get home, you can spend. I, I, I can't remember the trainer that told me this, but if you can spend 20 minutes a day with a dog, that is enough time for a dog to completely bond with you and do whatever you want it to do. And it seems like 20 minutes, that's it? <laughs> 20, you know, I know some people sit on a crapper in the morning longer than that. You know? And uh, yeah, 20 minutes a dog can bond with you. It, it can literally, I mean, and you wouldn't want to do that. I mean. It's, it's just from a dog behavior standpoint. They need, they need human interaction for that much a day. Hopefully you can give them more than that. But you know, living in Boston, you get out, you get out on weekends or when you say you work a lot, I mean. Oh, I don't leave your, the city. Monday through Friday, I don't even get in the car. You, uh, you work right around weekend, the city. I'm out all weekend. Yeah, we bang yeah, up like up north by New Hampshire, Dunstable, like out that way. Yeah. Yeah, if you can do that, you're fine. That dog will be fine. I, 
I, as long as you can, yeah, if you were like a, you know, a seven day a weeker and you only had holidays off, no, yeah. don't, don't, you know, get a, get a house dog, you know, um, they, they can handle what, what I would do is make sure when you find a dog, you know, get a dog that's going to be in, in, in find the breeder. I, I've told people this many times, find the breeder. Don't get stuck on a breed. Sometimes find the breeder nearby you that you can make a relationship with. And then you got a built-in, sometimes babysitter, sometimes, you know, uh, he'll he'll help you. He wants to see his dogs do good. You'll end up making a hunting buddy out of him or a friend out of the person. And you're going to be able to see the dogs that are going to be the parents. Because a lot of people, like, I watched uh, my, my girlfriend, uh, Bridget Nielsen, out in Montana. I saw her vichelas. I got to have her canyon wall vichelas, right? Got to have one. But they live in Boston. And I'm like... No, that dog, that particular dog needs to run every day, you know, yeah. because it'll eat its leg. <laughs> it's it's not it's not because it's a great hunting dog. It'll eat its leg if it's it funny. doesn't. Yeah. It. So my buddy is gonna get one as well. He lives in Charlestown. He lives in like a studio with no yard. He wants a Bizla. Oh God, no, no, tell him no, no. He can't I'm do it. Tell him you said that. He knows who you are. So okay, no problem. And you guys can write me. And in fact, you know, I'm sure uh, Kevin will say this at the end, but and Kevin can give out my email address. I, I filter calls and stuff all day long uh, from dog stuff. But I don't know if that really answered your whole question. I mean, you don't need, if you can get weekends out with your dog, mm -hmm. you, you can get it done. You'd be surprised how many people, I grew up in Chicago and you know, it's just like Boston. And there was a lot of people that had bird dogs. You know, they weren't neighbors of mine, but in hindsight, and I met them later on. They, they as long as the dogs got out on the weekends, they have a, you got a backyard to go play with them when you get home from work, do a little retrieving, do a little obedience work with them. Yeah, you can do it. You don't have to, you don't have to be a stay at home dad or mom to, to train a hunting dog at all. And anything up front I should know, like is, I assume the time commitment up front is more significant. Are we talking like time off commitment or are we talking like, just uh, heart, increased focus. I, I think increased focus. You, dogs can get by with a lot, you know. I, I mean, they can get by without a lot, but it, it need you. You need to increase your foot when you get home. You need to. You got some routines with that dog, and that dog will will adapt to your routine. So let's say you get up at six. You got to. You're gonna have to get up a little earlier. Take the dog out. You've you've had dogs before, so you know you got to potty train it and crate train it, um, but. Then yeah, sure, it'll be a little lonely out, outside in the backyard in its in its crate, but it's it's, it's going to be warm. It's going to be fine. And in young dogs, even most dogs, given to their own devices, dogs will sleep about 18 hours a day. You know, <laughs> I know it worked for me that would like to do that. You know, uh, they they people are like oh my god, what are you going to do all day while you're at work? They don't have they don't have a wristwatch. They don't have a Garmin Instinct. I can tell you that. Tells you your blood pressure. Your holy cow! I must be lying because my blood pressure's up. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, you 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 can do it. And honestly, I would uh, I would personally, you know, I, I'd be your uh, your birthing coach. Just you just stay in touch with me, and uh, I'd rather see somebody get into a dog that wants one. I don't care if you live in the city or you, wherever you live. If you live on a houseboat, you can do it. But it will take getting the right dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I looked a lot at the, you know, expectations physically around the breed, and I noticed, like, the Vizslas, uh, there's a couple others that just, they have to be running, right? Whereas if you get something a little more calm, maybe like a Golden or something? Yeah, I mean, you know, Golden Retriever is, it's a real underrated dog. It was a great hunting dog back in the day. It got, it makes one of the best pets in the whole world. So now it's hard to find a good Golden. You know. Yeah, I, I went through a bunch of breeders and there's like three or four that seem like consistently reputable for field dogs right, and beyond that. Right, right. And then, and let me tell you a little trick. Whenever you're looking for a puppy, do not tell them that I work all day and the dog's going to be in the kennel for the most part of the day. And okay. don't tell them Ron said it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> going to find a nice girlfriend. And, you know, we'll split there it. you go. <laughs> there you. Yeah, and like you said, a, a dog sitter, as somebody come over halfway through the day and play with it in the yard, that's that's perfect. Wow. All right, cool. Thank you. Nick, I've trained a German short hair that stays in a crate eight hours a day. 
and I get him out in the evenings. And this past year, picked up 36 birds. I've trained him myself off kind of the same deal that you're looking at. So it can be done. I have zero training. Bought a book and YouTube. Mm -hmm. Do it. So All right. It's desire. It's just desire to do it. Desire to do it uh, is 100% between you and the dog. So yep. uh, good luck to you. like the same thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and my question is, how do you handle the off season? Like, I've got a dog that his kryptonite is the up one bird. He right. loves it. He's ate up with it. But yeah. I sit here. I live in the middle of Sedalia, Missouri. Not a great big town, but I live in town. Got a mm -hmm. half acre, and I have zero upland birds to entertain him with. So how do you right. handle off-season for your dogs? You know, dogs, dogs, as long as, they, as long as they're doing something, you, everything a dog does out in the uplands is, is they got from their parents. That's all instincts. You didn't, you didn't teach that dog to hunt. Yeah. That dog's, that dog's grandparents and great, great grandparents taught it all it needs. All you need to do is work on obedience and obedience can be just as mentally taxing on a dog as a day in the field. So if you've got that kind of time in the off season, I would get, I would personally, what I, I like is a training table. I don't know if any of you are familiar with NAVDA. Um, it has a chapter near them, but you can get their, their green, it's called their green book. Um, or you can always get a hold of me later. You could keep a dog's a dog's mind going just with high level training. I mean, like literally, make a circus dog out of it. Make yeah. that you know, teach it to sit down, roll over, get the beer, open the fridge, grab you a beer, you know, um, and then you know, and then yeah, and take it on some bike runs. You know, you can pedal a bike around. Yeah, I with the won't. with the whole stay at home. Yeah, out of us. I've, I've taken him out multiple times a week and yeah. uh, I've been averaging about three miles a day through the woods, scouting yeah. trees. And I, I've been taking all of my dogs. I've got a German short hair, I've got a Springer, and I got an Aussie. Uh, yeah. All high energy dogs, <laughs> minus my Aussie, who did not read his breed standard. Uh, but they are, they get out and they run and it's just, it's a release for them as much as it is for me just to be able yeah. to get out of the house and everything. So, yeah. Um, yeah but he, I, I don't think of the off season as like the, the bird, like, like to me, bird season is, is for us. You know, um, yeah. the, the dogs can be happy doing anything. I mean, if, if the dog likes to retrieve, have some retrieving games for it, but yeah. you know, but not just the, the throw the bumper retrieve, you know, Make them sit, make them wait, go put that bumper in the corner, go hide that bumper, make them work for it. You can do a lot of things in your backyard that'll keep the dog happy in the off season. So it doesn't like, all have to revolve around birds. Yeah, it's so like one of the things I noticed with my German short hair this year, um, we, we do have a, a small area where you can get into some wild birds, but here in central Missouri, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of hen raised birds. So sure, I'm not sure. too uppity to go, go shoot a pin raised bird, a point to point, you know, whether. Hey, I'm and, a big, I'm a big proponent. I love, I've been to his, I've probably shot, well, I've shot more birds reserves than I've shot in the wild. Yeah. But that's because you, know, you kind of know you can, but I mean, I'm a big fan of, and the dogs don't care. It's a big so, Easter egg hunt for me yeah, and for the yeah. dog. But uh, the one problem that I noticed with my dog was as soon as, and like I said, he's ate up with it. He, he's got a firecracker shoved up his butt as soon as we get in the field. And the first two birds, I would mm -hmm. might as well just watch fly away. Because he would be just, it's new area, it's new ground. And he would just, he knows we're hunting, but he is hunting so big in the beginning that. He, he's kind of overrunning his nose and everything. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so. So I, I took a mental note of that, and this year during the summer, I've, I've really worked on that. Hey, you stay with me at heel till we get to the to where yeah. we're going and yeah. everything. Then I turn him loose. Right, right. Yeah, you, you people don't. I'll, I'll give you guys a quick story. I was like a very typical 
oh God, I had, you know, I'm on my, let's say my third dog, whatever it was, I can't remember. And when I got involved with NAVDA, because it's a training and testing, there's no first place. It's like you have the test. All dogs can get the same score. It's not a first, second, and third. There's no, there's no gold cup. It's just an evaluation by the judges with a numerical score. And I remember two of these guys came out and they wanted to go hunt with me. And or they wanted to hunt because I lived up in better grouse country than they did. And so I went hunting with them. And I remember the one guy, I let my dog off the tailgate, open the tailgate, let my open the dog kennel up. And he's running around like a banshee, you know, just like, like a, I don't know what you want to call it. Just like, he's never been out of a kennel in his life. Just running these big circles around the truck. I'm screaming his name out. He don't care. And I, I'm kind of embarrassed now, you know, I'm like, I can't even get my, my, the Tinkerbell on his collar because he won't, he won't stop running around the truck. And these other guys, they were older than me. They, they've been through it before. And I'll never forget Dick. He dropped the tailgate on his truck. He opened up his kennel. His dog's name was Buford. And Buford comes jumping out of the truck, acted just like my dog. And I was like, oh, good. His dog's a piece of shit, too. His dog, <laughs> his dog made one loop around the truck and acted just like my dog. One loop around the truck. And Dick said, Buford. And Buford sat. And I was like, how did, how, 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 how did you do that? You know, he goes, I told him to sit. I said, yeah, but he was acting just like I was act. He was acting just like your dog. It was like, like my dog. He's like, yeah, but you didn't even train your dog to sit, so, you know? So you can have that high energy dog you're talking about. You'd be surprised. You can override all what you think is like, you know, a, a firecracker up his ass or a bottle. Rock. You can override that old. I've seen the most high energy dogs in the world act like perfect citizens. So in that off season, work that obedience, work that obedience with your dog. And I mean, with distraction, like, you know, have, have your daughter just went by the sink over there. You work the dog on heel and have her over there kicking a ball or throwing a, a frozen pigeon to her friend, you know, and you make that dog walk on heel over here and you say, ah, uh -uh, no, we're in school right now. You know, use that, use that time of year for some high level obedience work. It won't hurt them. Because the more you let them run, the more they want to run. We know that. Yeah. So it goes back to the Playboy analogy. <laughs> the, the more you, the more garbage can lids we could pick up and find more, we would. But we still had to go in at night. You know, we we couldn't do it all the time. They only threw them things out once a month. Uh, my question. Well, first, thank you guys for hosting this. This is awesome. Uh, of course. Uh, your thoughts are on on training a flusher with a pointing dog. We've been considering getting a, a field bred English Cocker. I have a three year old GSP. And um, what are your thoughts on working a flusher with a pointer? Well, either you follow my podcast or you are coincidentally in the same boat as I am. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I just got a, a field bred English Cocker. She's gonna be two years old in June. And so that's, it's, it's a new road for me yeah. and I know I know I can hunt her, even with her little bit of training, I can hunt her with my older dog because he's pretty well trained. So you're three, you say you got a three-year-old GSP? Correct. How, how, how steady is he? How, how, how good is he in the field when it comes to? She's got a good range on her, but uh, she'll hold the point for a couple of minutes, two or three minutes at least. And then how about if she's with another, like you, you and your buddy go somewhere, does she get, does she get a little uh, competitive, try to move uh, up closer? Yeah, she'll get distracted. If I'm out with multiple hunters, she'll yes. see another hunter and be like, well, what are they doing down there, dad? Like, we should go take a look at them. And I go, no, we're looking for Chucker. I'm not walking way down this hill. <laughs> Sorry. Right, right. You get so, a little distracted. Yeah. So you're gonna have you're gonna have to use you're gonna have to get the short hair to a pretty high level of obedience, and and when you're gonna mix in the the, the flushing dog to the mix, you got to make sure that the flushing dog doesn't get in my opinion, it it doesn't get all the bird work like the typical picture that you're for the rest of the people or don't know 
So we got the dog on point and then we got the flusher comes in and that flusher is going to also learn real quick what that dog on point means I could be over here and oh, I know what that means. You know, he's going to come in there and it's going to zoom right past and it's going to get bird up. So now you're going to have to get the flusher highly trained because you're going to have to stop the flusher because sometimes you're going to want to let the short hair, if she's a good retriever, you take yep. that away from her, you know? So you're going to have to play a real balancing game. So what it means is you got a lot of training to do. You've got a, a lot of training to do. So you're saying get a wire hair. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Don't ever get a wire hair. No, I'm kidding. Uh, second question for you is what's the best state to take my GSP? I live in Oregon. I live in the gorge right now, so super lucky. Uh, but what's the best state to take my three-year-old GSP to get a mixed bag and go out of state? Boy, I, I don't think you could do better than North Dakota. North Honestly, Dakota. I would go to uh, North, Northeast, North, or I'm sorry, Northwest North Dakota. You okay. should be able to get into pheasants, a huns and sharp tails. Now, there's probably a few more places you could do that. You know, Kansas, you could get into prairie chickens, uh, pheasants, and quail. But it's you. You might look real hard and find to find all of them. You know, they're there. Um, so there's plenty of states you can do it. But uh, that's probably my favorite. And if it was only two, two species, I would hit South Dakota. Um, for sharp tails and pheasants, and, okay. and they've got and they got prairie chickens in, in South Dakota as well. Um, but yeah, you can you can uh, you can rock some hunt in, in uh, North Dakota, and they're fun. Cool. And then Thank you. find out that you can't hit a, 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 a you know a flock bird. You know, well now you hunt chuckers though, right? I hunt chuckers. I got my first hunt this year on public ground in Oregon, so that was pretty fun. And. Uh, yeah, but you know, you guys have so many hills. You're gonna love it out in North Dakota. It's almost flat. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. You might find me out there. Be the old guy that walks bent over and you'll see oh. the guy walking slow. Just stop me. <laughs> uh, Ron, I, I heard you mention uh, a wire hair. I'm looking uh, at getting a Griffon here. In yep. the next, as soon as possible, my dog is is retired after this last fall, so I need a new dog. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what are your thoughts on the the Griffon, and do you know any breeders that are ready to roll and have an opening? <laughs> well, it'll be easier for me to tell you about the Griffon than it will be for <laughs> me to find you a puppy. But it it is one of it is one of my favorite breeds, and one of the reasons is. They're, they're usually, and these are all averages, you know. It's usually one of the calmer dogs out there in the field. It's usually, you know, you've, the, the downside is you got a lot, a lot of them have a lot of coat, a lot of hair, a lot of face, eyebrows, you know, cockleburs, a lot of grooming and everything to them. But they're usually natural retrievers. You're usually good in the water. They're good at tracking. Um, and unless you're used to a field trial type dog, it's a good dog. It's a good dog. And I, it, and I, uh, I, I'm never going to stop giving shameless plugs for NAVDA, North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. You can go in their database, look up their breeders. They got them by breed. They got them by state. And those breeders, if they've tested and trained their dogs, which they do, you get a litter, you get a, you get a puppy from one of those litters, you've increased your odds uh, significantly to get a, to make sure that there's a good hunting line in there. But I would say in general, most Griffins, most Griffins are gonna be a, a good adequate hunting dog. Not high powered, but a good, good hunting dog. Yeah, I mean, I'm used to Chesapeake's and Golden Retrievers, so this will be my first pointer. Yeah. Um, and you kind of mentioned hunting with the two but you have to back off the flusher a little bit, but yeah, uh, you gotta have control in, of, over both of them, you know. Yeah. And I'm I'm saying that from what I'm told. Last year I didn't pay attention to shit. I just I, I let little Taffy run over run over <laughs> everything, and I made it worse. So that's why she, and and I've trained pointing dogs, 
Um, and Taffy's over in Wisconsin getting trained right now because she was just too cute. I just couldn't teach her anything, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I do like griffins. I really do like griffins. And you right. can get a hold of me later again, and I'll try to steer you to a couple places. Yeah, and I'd uh, also recommend North Dakota. I spent a lot of time in North Dakota and Minnesota. That's my, my two spots, so you'll have fun yeah, in North you know, That's another one for the other guy. You're right. Minnesota is – I don't want to drive everybody to Minnesota. No, it sucks here. Dark. Don't come. It's terrible here. Yeah, <laughs> Minnesota. You'd never be able to find three species of birds there, would you? Never. <laughs> That's my home state, Ron. <laughs> I, I like Min I'm liking Minnesota more and more. Yeah. Uh, so I have a chocolate lab nine months. This is my first uh, dog that I'm I'm training for hunting. Uh, I have had other dogs, but you know the, the first one really training. Mm -hmm. uh, they said nine months. I got him when he was about twelve weeks, and from he's a lab retriever so I was you know we were doing well on the retrieves before teething and uh, this winter it seemed like in southwest Michigan when the, the snow started uh, kind of started teething too so I I stepped away from from the retrieving not trying to uh, build bad habits on you know the, the pain in his mouth and such uh, I worked on healing some other foundation stuff was going well when he got uh, out of teething, the, I, I started doing some retrieves with him during our, our training sessions and they weren't, they weren't very clean. He was coming back to me and, and dropping it right away. Uh, right. so I started going into hold conditioning, uh, and that's, that's been going well. We've been doing that for a few weeks where, you know, he, he very willing to hold, uh, different objects for me, come to me and hold them. Uh, when he brings them to me, but then when I started to implement that out in the outside, uh, you know, in a more open environment, he seems to just get distracted when I send him on a retrieve. Either he gets to the object, doesn't pick it up, or picks it up and doesn't come quite back to me. So I, I stepped back and, and went to a hallway again, essentially, and trying to form that, bring the retrieve straight back to me. Uh, I'm just... I'm worried maybe I did something wrong that I I heard his retrieving instinct, but I just kind of want an advice on where to go here. Well, you know, retrieving is, you know, you think about a dog, it's a Labrador retriever. It's last name's retriever. You know, it, it should just, you think, well, it should just be a good retriever. But that that's a breed that has a lot of retrieving issues. It does. And, and it's not that the dog can't retrieve. You saw it retrieve before. It's just that it's probably something that you've you've done but not like maliciously or even acknowledged something that dog derived pleasure from either dropping it was fun he got distracted and more than likely unless you've actually taken a dog through hold and carry and all the way through force fetching a lot of people as soon as they see a little success with the hold and carry they think they got it and now now they're asking for just a distance retrieve or a, a, a fun retrieve. And there's a lot more segments to the hold and carry is the beginning of the forced fetch or the trained retrieve. There's a lot of steps in there that depending on what video you watch or what book you read, that can be left out. And then it goes back to what I said before, learning to read your dog. Like I've never, I never even considered teething an issue. I let puppies do whatever, retrieve, drag sticks, do whatever. And then I start some, I start hold and carry with all my pointing dogs as soon as they get their adult teeth, basically at six months. Now I don't take them all the way to force fetch, but I do the hold and carry. But I do, I do water bottles, PVC with gravel in it. I. I mix it up so much that when I say fetch and I have them hold and carry something, it doesn't matter what I put in their mouth, they're not gonna drop it. But I, I, take, a, I take a real long time with that. I, and, and what people oh. do, how long? No, I was gonna say now, when you, I, 
being fresh to this and uh, with this fourth force fetch, I what I've been following the training, uh, the guy he doesn't really do force fetch. It's more of building the habit of the retrieve, bringing things to you, the dog, the desire to bring the dog, uh, mm -hmm. and. He doesn't personally use uh, e-collars, and it's not that he doesn't, he tells people not to. Right. Uh, but I have also built in, I mean, he's very he's very willing to do things for me. He, he listens well. Uh, right. uh, I, I haven't felt like I need to have an e-collar and such, but I've also heard the force fetch. I, I don't know much about it, but I've also, right. it seems like it almost has a negative tone to it, like you're, it does, and 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 that's why a lot of a lot of places now, they uh, just like everything else, they called it the trained retrieve. Now, they they tend to not call it force fetching anymore. Um, but it, you know what? I I'll go back to being a kid back in, when you were kids or when I was a kid. If if you could get away with it, you would get away with it. But we had teachers that made sure we didn't. We had parents that made sure the teachers had the power. Dogs are the same way. They'll they'll find out what they like to do, and they're gonna do it. And force fetching is, if it's done correctly. I, I mean, you could, I, I we're we're filming a dog right now that's getting force fetched, and that dog's tail is wagging like a cocker spaniel waiting to go on a hunt. I mean, it doesn't even know it's being force fetched, and you do not have to. You're right. You do not have to use a collar. I took my wire hair zygon all the way to the invitational test, and that includes blind retrieves, marked retrieves. That dog never had an e-collar on its neck in his entire life. But I, he was force broke by hand. You don't have to use a collar to do it. So again, I think you guys can get a hold of me later. And I, I'm on the I'm in the road all the time. I love talking to people. Get a hold of me after this sometime, and, and we'll take it a little deeper. Okay. Plus, yeah, I really appreciate learning more about the force fetch. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot to it, and we we could kill everybody here, but but yeah, you uh, it, it's it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, and you probably skated through it a little bit. I'm guessing. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Ronnie, how's it going? Um, so I'm one of those guys with the uh, domesticated golden doodle for my family. He's about Yay! 17 months old, although he's more golden. I, I don't see any doodle in him. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but anyway, we, we walk around the neighborhood, get his exercise in and all that stuff. Beautiful dog. He has really beautiful point ability. In my opinion, I know very little about hunting dogs, but when he sees a squirrel or a rabbit, there's a ton of those around our subdivision. It is really cool to watch him just point and just sit there and just watch. And um, one of the things, as a side note, we've been trying to get him to retrieve, but when he comes back, he doesn't want to drop it right in front. He just likes to, he still is a puppy. He just wants to play Brady. with it or circle it around sure. me, that type yep. of thing. Um, is what's a good way to break that? I mean, I've, I've tried the basic thing of, you know, teaching him to drop it in front of me. Okay. You get a treat and he's starting to latch onto that. And I don't want to continue to push the idea of if he does this, he gets a treat and then you right. kind of wean off that. Is there a better way to do it or is that the right way to do it? Well, okay. Uh, how old is it again? Six, about 17 months, 17 months. And, and that's in, in my circle. And we, we got him at about 12 months. We haven't had him the entire his entire life. Okay, so yeah, you don't have any real background with him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Goldens. You know, I, I don't know that much about the Golden Poodles and Golden Doodles, but you know, Golds are usually a pretty good dog that wants to please. That's just a young dog. That is a very typical young dog presentation. It is rare to get a dog that just uh, s grabs whatever you throw and brings it up to you and lets you take it out. I mean, at best, they drop it at your feet. Mm -hmm. But the parading around you, I've seen that with older dogs. And that's usually a little bit of defiance, you know. <laughs> but with your dog, it's she just, she's real proud. She's real happy. They, they're real possessive. I would literally almost ignore it, you know. Um, okay. One thing, and I, and I probably didn't say this on any of the other questions. If you've got a young dog, and I'm just going to say, you, you got, 
you got this dog at 12 months and it's, you know, so you've only had a dog five months, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yep. So let's just pretend you got a five month old puppy because you don't know the backstory. Right. When you're out playing in the yard with, with a dog, people need to put what we call a check cord. You can make it, you can go to the store and buy some five inch climbing rope or, you know, put a, put a grommet on the end of it, put a snap ring on the end of it, tie the end of it with a knot. When you're running your dog around the backyard or, or the house, leave that, leave that, that 15 foot of check cord on your dog. So a lot of times, let's say your dog, let's say that your dog is, is retrieving and she's, she's making circles around you and you, you, you're trying to clean it up without doing a force fetch thing. I, I will tell you probably she'll clean it up on her own as she gets older, but at the same time, you can grab a hold of that rope. You can pass that rope around you. You can just keep letting her come around and you can shorten up that rope a little bit and give her a little good girl, a little good girl and stop her and don't take whatever it is. She, if she's still holding it in her mouth, don't take it out of her mouth. Hmm. Let her know that she can be closer to you. She's not going to lose it because what they are, they, they're they afraid like, well, if I, if, I, if I bring it right to you, I lose it, even though they get it again. Oh, yeah. They're kind of like little stupid children. I don't. I love kids. You know, <laughs> had had three daughters, had three grandkids now. But you know, at some point, there's a point where a child is literally almost stupid. Like they yeah. would walk into a stove, right? They would they would pull a pan of hot water over their head. They're they're kind of you know, and puppies are the same way. They're kind of dumb, and so they they get something that they want to own and they don't want to let it go. So what you do is you get that check cord, and while they're parading like that, you pull it in, pull it in, pull it in. You pet them a little bit, then let it go again. Don't mm -hmm. go for that retrieve. Don't, because the dog's still holding. That's what we want as a hunting dog. I want that dog to go, I want that in his mouth. I don't want it to drop it. And if you can pull it in, pull it in and pet it, let it go make another circle again. You, a lot of that'll clean up. Gotcha. It'll just clean up. And I'd like to hear how that dog does later on. Cause yeah. they're not supposed to point, <laughs> but. Oh, really? Oh pointing, man, he that's pointing, so cool to watch him do that. Pointing is a, a canine instinct. It's the pause before the pounce. You know, yeah. it's the pause before the kill. Yeah. And uh, and so but it, it's it exists in all dogs, you know. I've seen I've seen German shepherds yeah. things and stuff, but yeah. Well, we we've we've met before actually earlier in 2019 in Nashville at the last BHA event with with Kevin. So if you're back down here okay. for one of those, I'll I'll, uh, I'll bring him down. by. Definitely bring him by. Definitely bring him by. Cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna go down in uh, well whenever this band's lifted, I'm gonna go yep. down to Hunter Kennel's new new facility and maybe we can turn it into a BHA pint night to boot and everything. That'd be fun. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. you write me at Ron B R O N B at thehuntingdogpodcast.com. And Perfect. if you can't write it down, you can't remember, just look up, uh, you know, look up The Hunting Dog Podcast and it'll link up to everything. Um, you, you, it, it, ain't, it ain't hard to do. It, and if you send me an email, I'm not saying I've answered every email that I've ever gotten because every once in a while I'll swipe it the wrong way. And then someone's <laughs> like, hey, you didn't answer my... But, I love talking dogs and, and uh, I'll help everybody as much as I can, as much as I can. I, I want to see everybody be as frustrated as me under third dog and as happy as me under sixth. Mm -hmm.